At Casablanca, Patton worked with his staff on a battle plan for the invasion of Sicily. The Allied brass argued among themselves over that very plan, with the British unable to agree on a strategy even among themselves, let alone with the Americans. This squabble went on for three months, until Montgomery cornered Eisenhower's chief of staff, Major General Walter Beadle Smith, in the lavatory at Eisenhower's headquarters, and drew a very simple plan for him on a breath-smogged mirror. Montgomery's Eighth Army would land on the east side of the island's southeastern tip around Syracuse and head north. Patton's Seventh Army would land on the west side of the island's southeastern tip around Jella and proceed north. Montgomery would spearhead the main assault. Patton would protect his flank. When Montgomery's plan was accepted, Patton did not relish being cast in a supporting role, but he kept his own counsel, glad to lead the entire Seventh Army, and already visualizing a means by which he could not only upstage Montgomery, but also effectively steal the whole show. And that is what happened. Both armies invaded in the pre-dawn hours of July 10, 1943, Montgomery's Eighth Army landed with relatively light resistance. The next day, the fighting intensified. Along the eastern coast road and inland as far as the main highway, which lay to the west of the eastern coastal road and ran roughly down the center of the island, the Germans and Italians fought gallantly. The Eighth Army had to scratch and claw for every mile advanced. The amphibious landing was not so easy for Patton's Seventh Army as it had been for Montgomery's Eighth Army, High winds and rough seas disrupted the flow of the landing for the Americans. But after intense naval bombardment succeeded in subduing the German and Italian onshore artillery installations, the 7th was able to get ashore and establish a beachhead at Jella. The next day, just as for the British to the east, the German and Italian resistance intensified. Amid the fierce fighting that day, Patton and his key aides left their quarters on the Monrovia, came ashore and drove directly to Jella. Patton wanted to visit Lieutenant Colonel William Darby, his kind of officer, and his celebrated rangers, the Army's elite fighting force. Just as Patton arrived, the Germans and Italians unleashed a fierce counteroffensive. Patton swung into action. He mixed with the troops and rallied and exhorted them, roaring encouragement and snapping off commands. At one point, he helped load and fire mortar rounds. At another point, he mounted a rooftop and observed Italian tanks advancing across the plain north of town, headed straight for him. He shouted to a nearby naval officer, who was talking on a radio, to order the offshore naval guns to target the tanks. The cruiser Boise obliged and began knocking the tanks out of commission. The most crucial contribution Patton made that day was a decision he had made months earlier. He had convinced Eisenhower to change the disposition of troops at Jella. Patton argued for and won the placement of Major General Terry Allen and his battle-hardened 1st Division, popularly known as the Big Red One, as the main American force at Jella, replacing a unit composed mostly of less experienced reservists. Bradley, commanding the 2nd Corps, wrote in his memoirs that Patton's decision may have averted a disaster for his corps. Bradley believed that only the difficult General Allen and his combat-tested troops could have withstood the brutal German and Italian counteroffensive that day. Like Patton, Bradley did not like Allen, a hard drinker and a thorny warrior with whom Patton had an ambiguous friendship based on an intense and begrudging rivalry. That night, back in his quarters aboard the Monrovia, Patton confided to his diary that he had really earned his pay that day, and that throughout the intense fighting, he had not been much scared. 